it's a renaissance. And this is what I, again, what I really feel that COVID has opened up for us to, to really think differently about who we are and what we're doing and where we spend our energy. And actually now you're seeing this more and more, probably you're seeing this in the news like I am, of people who are saying, I'm not going back to that job that I had before. I have this different idea of how I want to live and what I want to do to help provide for my family. James Ehrlich is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. James is the founder of Regen Villages, holding BV, a Stanford University spin-off company formed in the European Union to realize the future of living in regenerative and resilient communities with critical life support of organic food, clean water, renewable energy, and circular nutritional flows at the neighborhood scale. James is also an entrepreneur in residence at the Stanford University School of Medicine Flourishing Project, faculty at Singularity University, senior fellow at NASA Ames Research Center, and an Obama White House appointee for regenerative infrastructure. James founded Regen Villages as a Dutch EU company, Im impact profit company in 2016. With its patented Village OS trademark operating system software to use artificial intelligence and machine learning to define, design, and autonomously manage regenerative neighborhoods that promote healthy long-term outcomes for residents and wider communities. Regen Villages are planned for global replication and scale in collaboration with established industrial partners, universities, governments, and sovereign wealth and pension funds, enabling an optimistic post-COVID green transition. James, welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks so much. I, I think you covered it all right there with that intro. It was perfect. No way. You've been doing this for a while and you, uh, you've you been around the block. And so you deserve that. You have, I'm sure, much more to your bio um, that I could probably read. But I think that's a nice insight. And, and really, I have to say, I'm tickled to have you on the show because uh, this is this is a discussion long time coming. It's something that I'm passionate about, and um, I think this is just going to be a nice podcast for for many of our listeners, but also just a fun time between the two of us. Um, I'm I'm going to start out kind of uh, hard and heavy with you and get into some 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 depth. First of all, just kind of how we came together and our paths have crossed. So I do a lot with Singularity University and with the SDGs. And I know William McDonough um, is one of my mentors. He's uh, at the Stanford University uh, Living Archive Library of William McDonough. So also tied to Stanford University. Although, as you've said, that's a very big campus and many, many things going on. I've had several other professors and lecturers, teachers who are also doing things with Sta Stanford, um, Larry Robertson and, and a few others on the podcast as well. And so uh, I, I just, I think that our paths have kind of crossed over the years and, and at different events and conferences, but it's good to finally uh, bring, it, bring it here on to a discussion that everybody can hear and, and discuss. Um, You've been doing this for a while and have got some great response off of your TEDx talk and, and tons of re resonance through people who, when is this going to be built? When's it done? We want to live there in this. And so you've, you've, you've heard probably not everything, but quite a bit around how do I get in? How do we do this? This is fabulous. And, and some learning curves in the process. And then bam. We were hit with 15 months of, or more, you know, we're still coming out of it. Craziness, pandemic, COVID, Black Lives Matters, Asian racism, the inauguration, on and on of crazy things our world's experiencing. And I want to know, 
have, have more people been knocking down your door to, to talk to you about these things since those things? And also that what you talked about of where we need to go to the future of living, the future of lifestyles, the future of infrastructure and regen villages in respect that that has proven to be a better model for lifestyle and life and, and operating system. And then I just want to know how have you weathered this time? Is it been good, bad, ugly? Oh, yeah. Thanks for asking. Uh, well, of course, uh, you know, COVID has been, been um, incredibly challenging and, and horrible for, for, um, millions of people and, and arguably billions of people on earth. It's at the same time, um, it has been a unifying force uh, that for the first time probably ever that the entire planet, uh, all humanity at once has had to face uh, this kind of challenge uh, simultaneously. And so it's, it's hasn't, you know, has been something that sort of touched upon everyone's lives across the last 15, 16 months. From our perspective, we had been predicting that there could be and will be these anomalies, right? That would make cities feel less safe. And, and of course the original research and idea was more around climate anomalies that would make especially coastal mega cities be places where not only would this brittle infrastructure start to break, but it would break badly for a lot of people at the same time. And so then you would start to see the, uh, the, the beginnings of some exodus from these various megacities, coastal megacities around the world back towards the countryside. Uh, <clears throat> now, many folks around the world thought that I and our group were kind of being chicken little and that the cities were always going to be this beacon of, 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 of modern living and to attract people away from the countryside and to live you know, in these sort of glass residential towers, steel towers, uh, skyscrapers, et cetera. And that somehow to be disassociated from the natural world uh, was modern living. And that you know, this was something that people kept telling me that, that there was no way to defy this trend, okay? Uh, so some people would chuckle, maybe laugh at us a little bit, uh, and me especially, for, for postulating this, this, uh, this thesis about life outside of cities. And, and so in many ways, COVID, when it hit, uh, it became really seemingly overnight this absolutely understandable uh, construct of exodus and not only that but that people could essentially work virtually and and be home and not have to be commuting and not have to be in these residential and, and urban um, towers and, and and offices so it's been a um, uh, a sea change and and and, a, and I think a really important sea change in many ways because we we have to embrace this idea of how far we've come away from the natural world as a species. We're, we're, we just imagine ourselves somehow being above and beyond and away from this symbiosis, which is rather ridiculous. Uh, so that's been a, these are all been actually positive things for us. And we have uh, continued to persevere uh, even though we haven't been able to, because of COVID and other things, been able to, you know, break the ground and move things forward the way we've wanted to do in these various places around the world to build regen villages. Nonetheless, the, um, the exodus from cities has really been pointing to this need for turnkey communities and neighborhoods like this. And a little bit more specific. So, I mean, you, you, in your TED talk, you mentioned your son and kind of how that sh shook you to think about the future and, and, and things a little bit differently. 
But had you applied some of that thinking, the things you've been speaking about and what you're designing in, in some respects to, uh, I assume you're not living in a region village right at this moment yourself, but but have you applied some of those pr principles into your life and just say, boy, I'm glad I, 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 I'm listening, I'm working towards what we're working on and, and applying it in my life. And it's proven to be a little bit more resilient or a better model or some of those principles of which are really not just regenerative principles, but they're principles of sustainability and, and different ways of lifestyle choices living. Well, I mean, to, to the best of our ability. I mean, currently I live in, in, a, in a small place, uh, you know, just a bike path away from campus at Stanford and which is, which is a really expensive place to live, an incredibly expensive place to live. Yeah. Uh, the, the connectivity we have with farm to table uh, communities is it's, it's here, but it still requires us to, to, um, to make those connections and, and, and to be close to those, to those family farmers. We, we do our best to, to, uh, to not drive and to, 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 to bike uh, wherever possible and walk. Uh, that's also been, been a wonderful uh, opportunity because of COVID not to have to fly and, and which was a big uh, part of an impact that I know I was making in, in terms of a negative impact in terms of all the flights I had to take. But this is a kernel, right, of, of everything we're talking about, which is the fact that um, little bits and pieces are important, right? But there has to be a systemic whole system approach to living in regenerative resiliency. And that's meaning that you're living in a passive home typology where the home itself is capable of generating more power and preserving more power and energy than a family needs on a daily basis. Then you're connected with, um, with uh, your, your clean water supply that is precious in how the circularity is happening, the renewable energy sources, the high yield organic food production, and most importantly, connected to all of that is this uh, waste digestion. So that human, animal, food waste, all the organic waste streams are actually asset classes and they contribute to, to, to you know, this neighborhood uh, flourishing. So that's really challenging to do living in a suburban context here in Palo Alto, California. Um, there's only certain, like I said, siloed pieces that we can touch upon. Um, we do our best, of course, but we know where we need to be and, and want to be, and that's what we're aspiring towards. So we're very much going to be the first inhabitants of Regen Villages communities around the world and, um, and look forward to, to the daily uh, connectivity that we know we feel <clears throat> when we spend time at some of our like research farms, for instance. So that's our goal, that's our ambition. No, normally you'd be surprised that uh, something like this didn't pop out of Berkeley because it's very much uh, uh, in, in, in line with some of the, the environmental movements around Berkeley, but I'm, I'm so glad that you brought it out. You've touched upon several things already that we can jump down some rabbit holes and go into extreme depth. I just want to, uh, even though this podcast will release much later and not at the same time as some of the others, I just finished a podcast with uh, Ilana Preuss, who um, does Re Recast Your City is a book that she wrote. And that's all about... Uh, rebuilding, remodeling communities, bringing back small manufacturing and, uh, and vibrant communities to your city. And uh, a lot of about resilience and regeneration and how can we um, take some of these communities and make them different. I'm lucky enough to have, um, 
Island Press, which is a fabulous publishing company, send me most of their authors that are around community and environment and, and food and things like that. And, and you touched upon one other thing. So these coastal areas and the big issues happening from climate change around coastal areas. I just did a podcast with uh, uh, Carolyn Kuski and Billy Fleming, uh, who wrote the, the book, A Blueprint for Clo Coastal Adaptation, Uniting Design, Economics and Policy around how do we change planning, urban development, HUD, and come up with a new um, thing as a, a, a coastal, instead of a Bureau of Land Management, a coastal uh, uh, land management um, type of a setup and start changing the policies and the rules. And so you're, you're in good company with what we're going to talk about, because that's what everyone's talking about now. That's what we're working on. Um, uh, you know, I've got books like Regenerative Leadership. It's a, a brand new book that came out as fabulous about communities. You probably know about um, Daniel Christian Wall, who wrote the book uh, Designing Regenerative Cultures. You know, this is not just a trend. It's not a fad. It, it's basically the next evolution. So how do we go from the eco view uh, um, the ego view to the eco view. And now we're actually going beyond to a regenerative view, which is an old Sanskrit word called seva. How can we be in service to life? How can we be in service to others with this regenerative way of thinking? And in, in your mention, just in this opening, you mentioned symbiosis, which is Lynn Margulis. I talk about her all the time, symbiotic earth and microcosmos and how, how do we think differently about the interactions of our world and, um, how, and, and systems, Fritz Hof Capra, systems thinking, the systems view of life. In our world, we've been taking this siloed linear approach to solve our, our global grand challenges and especially our infrastructure challenges. And before I ask you the next question, I wanna kind of make a comment. Just based on our sheer population growth today, not five years, but just today, we would need to build 63,000 schools every single week just to keep up with today's demands of population growth. That's all around the world, but I, I, I tell you that that number is pretty big in the United States. And I know for a fact, we're not even building 100 new classrooms a week. And a matter of fact, most of our high schools and campuses are now to meet the demand, putting up these shipping container classrooms and stuff because they're not expanding fast enough and we're not meeting the demand. And that was just one focus area that, I, that I'm pointing to as, as classrooms. We'll talk about food, infrastructure, energy, and, and how do we do that in a different way? Now, my question is, when I look at Regen Villages, when I've heard you speak, when I see the, the whole big picture, you're, you're not only creating a regenerative village and an a eco village that is a self-sustaining infrastructure and has all the basic needs there, energy, food, water, uh, sanitation, all those needs in that system. But in many respects, you're also capturing carbon, you're having a positive impact on, on the cl climate. So you're actually climate positive or climate beyond climate neutral. Uh, and you're, there's a basic measurement in life in, in the science community over 35 years on, on how we measure um, the planet's finite resources. And that's a global footprint. It's not just in greenhouse gas emissions, but it's your, your footprint, the global hectare. And um, I believe with these region villages for each person, you're increasing their global hectare well beyond today's 1.6 replicable global hectare per person. Um, and, and so I, I, maybe you could share your thoughts on, on those comments that I just made, it, it, uh, but I can also give you the, the hard question if you'd like first. Would you like that? Or sure. would you want to comment first? So, so the, the, 
the question is, is um, most of all, the ways that we live are, are outdated. The, the infrastructures are not up to speed. And um, maybe that's a, a thought that provoked you mo deciding on regen villages. Um, and so I want to know, is that why did some of those factors play into that? And how, what are you doing to help change this, this need and in infrastructure to change our urban planning uh, uh, processes and in, in this whole ecosystem, not just in the U.S., but all around the world? Obviously, you're starting in Denmark. No, it, we're, um, I mean, we the way I look at it is as follows. We inspired in many ways by, of course, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the dire warnings coming uh, that we, we've seen over, over the last decade plus. Um, and in combination with that was this Rockefeller Foundation report that I had read you know, back in, in 2012 which was really eye-opening because essentially it said that up until 1950, which is not that long ago, 75% of human population, which at the time was about two and a half billion people, uh, lived in small self-sustaining subsistence-based communities. And they were overproducing these artisanal ingredients across their family farms and whatever surplus they had they would bring to the piazza square to the village square to the community they would barter they would sell they would find some equivalent value uh, but moreover this is where they would uh, cross-pollinate ideas and thoughts and and seed banks and 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 it was a really um, rejuvenating uh, life-affirming kind of celebrations. This was where, where these really beautiful long table meals would, would happen and people would bring their ingredients and their recipes and it would bring, it would bring out the best in, in, in this kind of village-based culture and life. So in any case, fast forward, the same Rockefeller report uh, predicted that by 2050, uh, that 75% of the predicted 10 billion people living on earth would be living in these coastal, uh, very brittle mega cities. And of course that has really you know, been something accelerating and accelerating because for, for this amount of time from even before 1950, there was a concerted effort by industry to attract uh, young uh, workers to the urban areas to take factory jobs and assembly jobs and other kinds of employment um, and to sell them essentially a bill of goods that, that by living in the city, you will have, you're smarter by doing that. You have access to these things. You will, you will have greater wealth. Um, that basically that living on the farm, uh, you're, you're not a smart person. That's not the right place to be. So uh, that, you know, in a sense, was what kind of spurred this global trend away from the rural areas to, to the cities. So that was really impactful to me because I could see that we could actually create a new moniker of wealth, a new moniker of status, if you will, that by uh, reaching back out to the countryside and having place that secure and resilient and regenerative, that there's quite a bit of sex appeal in that. <laughs> that you, you, know, you become like a good uh, mating candidate, in other words. You know, you're, you're more capable of nesting, if you will. Um, so especially when you look at, at the global south, many of the populations who are living in poverty in and around these urban cities, these mega cities, are only half a generation or less away from their farmland. They, they really didn't have that, that long a distance in time to get to where they are now. So I, I really felt like, and I feel like we have this opportunity 
to create these places, to, to make it beautiful, to make them now additionally more and more turnkey with what we understand about uh, ecological restoration and regenerative uh, perspectives, that we can make it easy, in other words, for an urbanite to come out to the countryside and not have to worry anymore that they're not a farmer, that they're not an engineer, that they don't have the skills because these places will be constructed in such a way that they're capable of, of, of being there and living there and adapting uh, and becoming part of that fabric. So that's really where, where we've been um, focused on and, and, and trying to take, instead of a negative marketing approach about, oh, the doom and the gloom and all the things that we have to, to really face and the challenges, instead, you know, to look at the cases all around the world where just a few individuals even have completely restored an ecosystem by just taking the steps over some period of time to do that work. So we've taken now this industrialized approach saying, okay, there's, there's an opportunity for business to look at an impact-based profit and for these big funds, sovereign wealth pension funds and others to look at how they can uh, get asset back security on their investments, but also this long-term impact return where again, everything has to, we have to rethink everything in terms of what is work versus self-worth, what is economy versus, uh, versus gross domestic happiness. Um, and, and so there's lots of different ways to, <clears throat> to re-examine this renaissance. And I really wanna look at it that way. It's a renaissance. And this is what I, again, what I really feel that COVID has opened up for us to, to really think differently about who we are and what we're doing and where we spend our energy and actually now you're seeing this more and more, probably you're seeing this in the news like I am, of people who are saying, I'm not going back to that job that I had before. I have this different idea of how I wanna live and what I wanna to do to help provide for my family. And germane to this, okay, is the fact that the question arises, why do we go to work? What are the reasons that we need to have gainful employment? And that has to do with, gosh, 30, 35% goes to your living expense, your housing. Another X percentage going to your daily nutritional needs. Another X percentage going to your energy and, uh, costs and needs and demands. The, the water, the, the access to uh, communications, whether it's cell phone or phone or media, whatever it may be. Um, so in other words, if, if we can answer for living within a region, villages, neighborhood, community, infrastructure, 85 to 90% of what people's daily basic needs uh, require, then that delta for income or universal basic income can be dramatically reduced. And, and that's something I think starts to get really interesting and exciting that, especially when you look at how we can reduce burdens on governments, reduce burdens on healthcare systems, uh, on brokering peaceful, happy places. Uh, again, you know, the matrix of 17 sustainable development goals, each one of those 17 right next to it is, is the basis of Regen Village. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty um, lovely reminder about what we're onto here. I, I absolutely love that. Um, I don't know if you know, but in 2019, I started a new project with the United Nations and it's really not a project, it's a transformation in, in Songdo, Korea, the, the city of the future. Uh, it's for the next iteration after the sustainable development goals. And it's called, the program is called 
resilience frontiers and it could be that it's the resilience development goals what comes from 2030 to 2050 and we did a five-day workshop at the national adaptation expo in songdo korea which is a un adaptation event with the unf triple c future literacy labs and those um, to work on that because we're realizing we meet the sustainable development goals which will give us a nice sustainable infrastructure, so to say, to springboard off into resilience too. And, and even more than resilience, it needs to be regeneration that we truly springboard off onto. How do we dial back in the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries and start to let our, let our world regenerate itself in, in many respects? Um, the, the interesting thing that you, you've talked about, I want to touch on two things, but I do want to go into Village OS and the technology, but I want to, want to hold off just a second before we get into that technology. Regen villages, villages, eco-villages, um, there's Bedzed in the United Kingdom, there's uh, Fintorn in Scotland. Matter of fact, I've got one of the first books Paul Hawken ever wrote right here about fin, Fintorn. Um, and uh, Auroville, and, and, and then there's some bigger projects emerging uh, as, as well that actually started before, um, before the pandemic, and that is the Red Sea Project and um, uh, Neom City, which is uh, Draw the Line. It's 175 kilometer long, four season, four section, big, huge place in, in Saudi Arabia. And I, I've helped a few of these places talk about and address the livability aspects of a regenerative village and how, how do we make it survive and sur survive and, and get through these times, not only as an environmentalist and as activist and a sustainability expert, but, be, but I'm used to building infrastructures and know what it takes. How do you build a self-sustaining infrastructure that provides kind of an off the grid Tesla eco villages, as you as you mentioned in your moniker there behind you, um, one that provides the basic resources. So full water management system, full renewables, and that's how do you produce energy? Full local food systems, you know that that are growing and sustaining itself, and, and that they're passive houses that are good to live in, but also that, you know, they breathe and don't create toxic chemicals and are intertwined with this symbiosis of, of our world. And some of these villages have been very successful and others controversial or could be seen as a uh, as a commune or a crazy place, you know, to some people, like you mentioned, some people say, oh, I just wants people to go off the grid and, and, and promoting different things. Um, I'm so glad that they did that because they're all learning lessons of how we can do it better and, and the problems and issues that, that are confronted in that respect. And, and that's kind of where my question is leading right now is, um, when you go to undertake such a project, there's a lot of government, city, and community level support that are needed besides the, the uh, planned urban development uh, and uh, housing urban development, uh, uh, site planning, regulatory permitting that are required. Just one from BedZ in the UK, they you know, they had this beautiful dream, but then they had to have so many parking stalls in really an odd talk, they wanted to be a biking, walking type of community just to meet the codes of the city. And how, how are you being confronted with this and moving forward with some of these, these things that could be a struggle? Are you seeing that you need to address some of those things or uh, kind of give us a little bit more insight of what you're yeah, dealing with? It's, it's, I have to tell you, um, you know, and I say this often, okay, it's not a matter of science, technology, or physics to be able to create really beautiful, flourishing, regenerative and resilient neighborhood infrastructure, villages, towns, uh, retrofits. It's not a matter of technology or physics or science. It is 
absolutely about political will and the funding. So those are the two key things. It's money and political will. And usually if you have all the money in place, the political will can get a bit easier, but that's not always the case. Um, so the truth is that when you look at the rules and the regulations on planning and, um, and permitting and, and zoning and all these different things, most of those rules have been placed on the books by district scale utility companies. Uh, they are placed on the books 100, 150, 200 plus years ago by companies, by I would call them robber barons who control the monopolies of water supply, of energy supply, of waste, um, of big ag. Uh, you know, you look at the work of like Robert Moses and those kinds of folks on on the car is this, you know, is everything. It's the preeminent force, isn't it, in design thinking, where the highway goes right to your, you know, your garage door practically. And and people just kind of as they pull into their garage, the garage door is closing behind them and, and they have no need to be interacting with, with, with others. So it's the rules have, um, have been in place for a long time and they, they've almost, I think, reached a kind of like biblical proportion that you cannot imagine changing these rules because they were placed on the books so many eons ago. And, and yes, there, of course, there are, there are questions around clean water and, and health and managing, you know, to, you know, for whether it's fire safety or seismic, you know, proofing or other kinds of aspects, all critically important things. At the same time, uh, there are all of this, um, all of these components that have been proven to work really effectively that can clean and recycle water, can deal with fire suppression, um, building materials that address seismic um, anomalies and other kinds of things. And, and, and there's no good reason why they can't be, be brought to bear and create a new rule book, a new overlay, right? So I take a Bucky Fuller approach to this, you know, Buckminster Fuller, which is to say, instead of fighting, you know, the old way, uh, we create a, a new model that makes the old model obsolete, right? That's his quote. And so to use a village operating system software, the village OS, to create a digital overlay of um, both the existing rules and regulations, which by the way, are typically not available to the average mortal uh, to even understand where you find all those rules and regulations even in a local government, right? They don't know what the regional government rule books always have to say, or the national policy, the state policies uh, are, uh, are on about. So they have to bring in these very expensive consultants who not only know about those rule books, but for crying out loud, they're the ones quote unquote, interpreting those rule books in a way that makes those projects either uh, green-lighted or, or not. So um, we, we see software as the great leveling uh, opportunity to use machine learning, especially to look at all the complexity of different rule books, look at the complexity of, um, of, of planning conditions, nature, uh, housing, but also that, that the software itself can reduce the rhetoric across all the different stakeholders that we can bring in indigenous First Nations wisdom to natural flows, right? Of what the land really wants and needs to be flourishing and blossoming and fruiting and connect that with some percentage of new build or retrofit, right? So that we, couldn't, we can unleash the uh, green belt or agricultural land to, to new kinds of build and development. And then beyond that is to see how the Village OS software can operate those communities effectively and manage them within their natural boundaries and footprints. 
So essentially, we can use software to create the circumstances for a better way of living. And, and there's a lot of knowledge and, you know, the folks that you mentioned, you know, uh, you know, Fiendhorn and Bedzed, Oroville, um, we're standing on the shoulders, if you will, of so many brilliant people who have come before us, you know, whether it's Rudolf Steiner, Buckminster Fuller, Bill Mollison, um, Bill McDonough. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, we're, we are um, integrators, if you will, of this brilliance, you know, into, into much more kind of um, bite-sized and uh, approachable function at the neighborhood scale, at the village scale. So that's, that's our, our main goal is to change the rules and to make it not just for us, not just for regen villages, but for landowners, developers, governments, most importantly, communities to be able to create these really beautiful places that are safe and healthy and, um, and create strength over time that they get better, they improve over time. Traditional subdivision, let's be frank, traditional subdivision that gets built, it's pretty soul crushing. <laughs> energy wasting, car culture uh, kind of place, right? An eco-village infrastructure that's regenerative and resilient, it just gets more and more beautiful and improves actually over time. And it's just like, you know, when you take a walk through a country path and you're able to, you know, pluck some kind of fruit or pick some kind of berry and you're seeing the pioneer and the heirloom growth coming that you hadn't seen before. Um, there's this celebration, this life affirming celebration that you're part of something. And that's really, really important. That's something I just feel that visceral connection to nature is, is really what we're focused on. And at the end of the day, it's actually pretty simple stuff. I really love that. And, and, and it, it needs to be simple because um, especially in today's day and age, people um, want don't want to read pages and pages of ingredients and labels. They don't they, they want to live con convenient lives that are comfortable, that they can stop and think and, and kind of connect with this nature. And so the communities that you're creating is is a whole different lifestyle it's a, it's what i call aloha so not the hawaiian greeting aloha it's an adaptive lifestyle of health and sustainability and uh one that's within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries and this aloha thinking of uh, of lifestyle is really a sinus milieu from the milieu institute in switzerland that talks about segments uh, of type of how people live and and uh, marketing seg segments as well there's this um big trend and, and and this is what i want to touch upon before we go a little bit more into the village os and the technology there's this big trend now regenerative has almost become a buzzword but it's not a trend it's something that's been around forever it's been uh been around for a long, long time. It's part of being part of this symbiotic earth and having this symbiosis. Um, but uh, for, exa for example, there's this book, Local, Fu Local is Our Future from Helena Norberg Hodge. And she, matter of fact, today is World Localization Day. And it's about creating local economies, local futures that people are coming back to smaller communities they're creating their own economies, their own futures, their own basic resources and needs that sustain themselves. Because right now, a lot of these communities that have had outside bigger production and manufacturers and big governments and grown, that the those nice ways of living that that you know the grandparents and your elders remember 
uh, are no longer there. It's very stressful and high, uh, especially in India and other places, high death rate, high racism, high, uh, just tons of problems, infrastructure problems that, uh, as well that people are kind of going back to that. And, and in that process, they're also shunning technology. And, and, and this is where I will, will really want to talk to you because you've addressed, you know, systems thinking and which also ties to complexity science and how, how, how do we use these systems. Humans are very good at thinking linear and lateral and thinking in silos and we create a rule and we think that's the fix forever. Uh, that in 2018, our entire world realized that that linear siloed approach is no longer working to solve our global ground challenges, let alone our local challenges. And they switched to kind of this systems approach to solving the problem through dynamic modeling and, and digital things. And for the United Nations, I belong to this group called the Digital Ecosystem for the Earth. It's using satellite data collected through thousands of different providers and, and data sources in, in one spot. And matter of fact, uh, the, the next uh, month from, from today, it just started today for the next month, the EU and uh, the United Nations have come together with Connect University to do a summer school course called Digital for Our Planet. How can we use these digital tools, the satellites and those things to, to capture the carbon, to see where the problems are, to use that information to heal our planet? And one of the biggest topics in this uh, summer course, the summer uh, school course, is the digital twin for the earth. How can we see by certain things that we do what the effects will have in a digital space so that we don't do the harm in the real space um, by making poor decisions in our planning? Um, where I'm going with this is I'm 100% sold that your Villages OS is something that we need. We need some kind of um, machine learning intelligence uh, system that helps us linear lateral siloed thinkers think in complexities or, or it assists us. It doesn't take it over. It doesn't make the eco village or the re regen village some robot or some crazy cyborg place. What it does is the complexities of how ecosystems work. It, it, it takes that knowledge and makes sure that the system continues to work in harmony with, with the codes and the environment and, and that. And, and, and that's kind of how I see it, but, but I don't know enough. Uh, I only know enough to be dangerous. And so that's what I'm saying. Will you please tell us more? And am sure. I on the right way of thinking of what, what I just said, or is yes. it more yes, different so than this? No, you, 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 you hit the nail pretty much squarely on the head in terms of a digital twin that's capable of, of uh, modeling uh, optimizing through simulations and these lovely positive uh, feedback loops, right, on how to um, improve and or mitigate uh, against risk. Now, the inspiration of the Village OS software um, is biomimetic, it's biomimicry. We look at nature itself. Um, when I came to Stanford in, in 2012 and I got involved um, early on, what's called the solar decathlon competition. And I was part of the Stanford team in 2013 and 2015. Um, and that's for those people who don't know what the solar decathlon competition is. It's a, was a Department of Energy, US Department of Energy competition of who could build the most energy positive house and home. And these wonderful masters and, and, uh, and PhD students would come together and they would design a house that was hookup ready, but they would make it, they'd have to build it in such a way that it would be uh, transportable, flat pack and shipped to some designated location on earth around the world. And then would have to be, the competition was that it would need, uh, they would only get two weeks to build it in that designated location. And, um, and it, would, it would be built in, in two weeks and, and it would be there in, in this community of these other 19 homes, right, in this little village set up. Um, and it was built on top of 
of, of a microgrid, you know, and, and the one that I had witnessed, uh, you know, in, in uh, 2013, 14 was Schneider Electric microgrid substrate, right? So load balancing, at least focusing on power, right? Because it were energy positive. So it was an energy competition. And so the homes were really mostly around passive energy um, kind of um, means. But um, when I looked at it, I, I went to the professors and I said, look, it occurs to me that a smart house inside of a dumb neighborhood doesn't make much sense. And, um, and I was really lucky and blessed with, with these professors, especially uh, Professor Larry Leifer from the Center for Design Research um, at Stanford University, who, who you know, has this whole philosophy about design empathy. And he leaned in and he said, okay, I really like this, where you're going with this. Let's, let's talk more and more about, about this concept of, the, of the, the sentient neighborhood in support of, 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 um, of this, these energy positive homes. So um, that led me to, as a coming from a software background, my background is in besides case study research of organic and biodynamic family farms, my initial background really was in software and video game design. Um, so I was looking for, and I was particularly interested in this idea of a software relationship to the natural world. Where can we find a communication protocol, an integration point with symbiosis? And so um, in looking into this, uh, I started to learn about the work uh, of, of Dr. Suzanne Simard from the University of British Columbia, who had lovingly uh, you know, re reframed the, the term, the World Wide Web into the Wood Wide Web. <laughs> um, in, in this lovely story about how she had discovered this, this essentially this ethernet network under the forest floor of these mycorrhizal, mycelial, you know, fungal bundles. And, and so her research proved actually that these, these um, uh, fungal inoculations into the roots, the very roots of these trees and bushes and shrubs, foliage and and even cultivars, you know, across vast distances, right? We're communicating with each other across species, not only communicating through this electrochemical signaling, but they were conveying nutrients to each other uh, in a have need network. And beyond that, and it gives me goosebumps even to talk about it, is that it, 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 it's a, it's a long-term ledger it's actually a ledger under the forest floor tracking um, this, these gifts uh, back and forth to each other in, in, in the natural world. And so that she proved that these old growth Douglas fir trees, these mother trees in the Pacific Northwest were conveying all kinds of minerals, carbon, sugar, nitrogen, you know, all kinds of goodies to these maple seedlings, different species, that you would think that seedling would die off in the forest floor in the shade of all of these trees. That's the Darwinian logic, right? But no, that the forest agreed that this maple would have something delicious to give back 10, 15 years from now. That blew me away. That made me feel like, wait a second, if we could create a digital mycelial network, that could understand for the first time ever, the nutritional flows at the substrate of a neighborhood, food, water, energy, waste to resource management, connectivity to passive, quote unquote, smart homes, um, external services of mobility on demand, mobility as a service, uh, curriculum, healthcare, and economy, especially, right? that we can have this new form of, of a digital ledger that relates to our activities in community, that we could essentially uplift and create these places where people are living in these communities with, with a much broader understanding of our place um, in, the world on this planet, 
in our ecosystems and and what a gift that is that we can that we can be together and celebrate this abundant surplus now i want to just go a, a couple steps further with this because part of where i am now at stanford university as an entrepreneur in residence in the stanford flourishing project which is part, part of health and human performance um, but I, I, I took a step in between the School of Mechanical Engineering to the School of Medicine by um, first joining this wonderful group under Dr. James Doty called the Center for Compassion, Altruism, Research and Education, or, or CCARE. Now, this is in effective neuroscience. This is the, the Department of Neurosurgery, actually. But that there's been this incredible bed of research on how we can improve healthy outcomes by reducing stress. And that you can reduce that stress by creating compassion and altruism and empathy. But in order to do that, you have to feel that you're in a position of abundance, right? To be generous, you have to feel like you have more than and you're not living in scarcity, right? So <laughs> these are also the tenets of flourishing. Um, so we love, you know, this whole journey that we've been on from the nuts and bolts of, of mechanical engineering um, and, and, and software development to, to the broader, you know, scientific um, uh, medical uh, and health perspectives of compassion, altruism, and, and empathy, and how that are the building blocks. All of those are building blocks for true flourishing. Right. And when we get to that place where we can really flourish, which is, you know, everything that Bucky Fuller had been saying for a very long time on Spaceship Earth, that there's plenty enough resources to feed and house and clothe and and support 10 plus billion people. That we get to a place of generosity of spirit. And then that's a whole new area of knowledge and education and trust. Um, and, and again, all of those SDGs blend perfectly, you know, with creating these beautiful, peaceful places. Um, but we do have to change the rules. We do have to wake up and understand that in order to build these places, policies have to change uh, on all of those different topics. But in any case, I just wanted to give you the inspiration behind the Village OS software, that it is related to these mycorrhizal bundles, which, and I'm gonna just drop one extra little point there, is it's part of our DNA. Some people can say it's somewhere between nine and 30% of our DNA is fungal. Um, if you look at neurons and, 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 our, and our, just even the way our, our, our brain stems are, are formed, it looks very much like a bundle. The other thing is, that the mycorrhizal you know, fungal networks don't have a single brain infrastructure. They have um, intelligence at the point of sensing. So it is a sentient being. They're the largest living organisms on earth. They can span 200, 250 radial kilometers. You can imagine. And one of the oldest as well. Oldest, largest, right? Now yeah. here's something really trippy to add to that mix, right? which is that most recently they've discovered at a cosmological scale that galaxies are interconnected by these thin fibers of dark matter. And when simulated, it looks a whole lot like a mycorrhizal bundle, which oh. means to say that even though when you look at galaxies and everything is sort of just spread out and looks like chaos theory and whatever, there's actually an interconnectedness going on. We're, there's actually a uh, neurological network potentially that our cosmos is part of. And then that brings us really right back to Rudolf Steiner's work yeah. <laughs> in terms of planting from a celestial body schedule. So uh, absolutely um, connecting the dots, yeah. if you will. Yeah. And, and that's what we need to do. I mean, it's about awareness and education. These aren't things that we learn in school. These are not things that even we rarely learn in higher education. Um, but 
uh, our wisdom has been around for a long time. So, I mean, uh, I'm a graduate of uh, uh, Fritz Hof Capra's uh, systems view of life, and he talks about chaos theory and complexity science and how that's tied into systems thinking and, and how, how we do this. The funny thing that a couple of things that you mentioned. So you talk about the, these microcorsial bundles, but really Lynn Margulis that I showed before, she really discovered mycorrhiza, mm -hmm. uh, which is even deeper than these bundles as well. And, and, and it was way back. She was Carl Sagan's first wife and is the groundbreaking scientist that uh, kind of went against neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism, that it's not only the, the strong survive, natural selection, survival of the fittest, that it's uh, the, we have microorganisms and fungus in our bodies. We're part of the bigger biome of our earth and that they're really tied together and it's in collaboration and cooperation that it works. And really what I love about what you you said, and I want to touch on the Buckminster Fuller, so Bucky for a minute. There, um, there's the coined term spaceship Earth was actually Kenneth Boulding, Kenneth E. Boulding, an economist. Uh, in 1964 is the first time he coined the term and talked about it. And then he uh, talked about it again in 66 in his book. Um, and it really says the economics of the coming spaceship Earth. Anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economic or economist. And really, it's so true. And then Buckminster Fuller comes just a few years later in 1969 and publishes the operating manual for Spaceship Earth. You know, our Buckminster Fuller and there's the Buckminster Fuller Institute and, and that but I don't know if you, I, I have a couple copies of that book, but on the back of that book, uh, we've all heard from the business area as well, which, you know, you're, you're in resident entrepreneur, business person for Stanford. Uh, we've heard of Simon Sinek's why. Does your business, do you have a why for life and what you want to do? Right on the back of this book, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, Buckminster Fuller, gives us his why to make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or the disadvantage of anyone. That's the best why I've ever heard. I, I love the, the, the quotes that you, you've given of Bucky as well, but it's so vital that we get this education. We understand the true workings of our world so that we can create villages like this so that we can use even the technologies to help us become more part of this symbiotic earth and maybe a homo symbios uh, type, type of a thinking, this integral part of how we work and, and that it's not complex or, or spooky or hard or a lot of math or science, but that it's just the way the world works and we're equipped one way or the other with those same tools. I mean, we just said we have that, those, uh, the microbiome and, and back to microbial genes and microbial cells in our body that might outweigh the human cells and the human genes in our bodies in, in many ex, uh, aspects, but that we learn how, how to, how to make those work in, in harmony and collaboration one with the other. So, you're really just, uh, you're, to me, you're preaching to the choir, but it's nice that we're kind of having this discussion with our larger audience so that they can understand that there are some other, other systems out there. I, I, I believe I also know some of the answers to the questions I'm going to be asking you now. We're going to get a little bit harder questions. The, the first one is, are you a global citizen? And how would you feel about the removal of all borders, walls, and limitations um, that have been set by nationalism from this COVID time and inauguration or whatever, but also just moving forward, separating humanity one from another, but more so than one from another of that of our ecosystem, our earth, and, and, and the way we live 
and maybe put that into the guise of, of what you're doing with the regen villages, which I see as a reconnection in, in a lot of respects. Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. And, and I, I have to say that our primary focus is on local, regional, regenerative resilience, and that the uh, reliance on globalized you know, infrastructure is not the smartest way forward. That we, we really have to be able to have the skills, the capabilities, <clears throat> the, 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 the functionality, if you will, at doorstep access to hydrate ourselves, feed ourselves, empower ourselves, digest our own waste, create the circumstances, um, not of libertarian you know, kind of political thinking, but really break away uh, safety, you know, that these areas and communities can be islanded, <clears throat> excuse me, in case of some kind of anomaly or anomalies. <clears throat> so it is, um, <clears throat> it's that kind of thought process that allows then us to be better global citizens because we have <clears throat> strength in our own footprint and safety. And we can then think big thoughts. You know, I, I often to say that um, if you have a delicious meal of, of you know, farm to table ingredients, organic biodynamic, and you're, you've absorbed that bioavailable nutrition and you're sitting at this long table with friends and family and people who aren't even speaking maybe the same language, but you're just enjoying these aromas and flavors and recipes that represent these stories of where people come from, that all of a sudden you can sit back and you can have a big smile on your face and you can, you can think about bigger things. You can think about how you fit what you can do for others. Right again, it comes back to this idea of, of of abundant surpluses and flourishing. So, so I'm 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 a globalist in the sense of a globalized, industrialized scale to to regional local development. Does that make sense? Using locally sourced earthen building materials and 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 prefab and 3D extruded construction methods to design for extreme affordability, especially these neighborhoods that can ex nihilo from nothing be built within a, some period of a few weeks even come to life. And over a period of a few years, they become um, really self-reliant the, within their own symbiosis that if we can create these, I mean, rapidly create these lily pads of self-sustaining beautiful places around the world that they can start to interconnect with each other um, regionally, locally, regionally, nationally, but then globally that, that we can see a border-free exchange of data, right? These beautiful repositories of data that are climate related so that a neighborhood in for instance, outside of Oslo in Norway can communicate with a neighborhood uh, in Alberta, let's say Canada, and learn from each other, even though they're not in the same country uh, and, and autonomously improve and or mitigate against risks. And I think that's really the exciting idea that you wake up in the morning and your neighborhood has had a bit of a software upgrade based on that knowledge. Um, it's imperceptible to you uh, except for the fact that your neighborhood just is getting better and better every day, <laughs> that there's more flourishing, that the, there's more bioavailability to your nutrition, that, that things are just getting easier or better, right? That's, that's how we really apply this to the human condition. But I, um, I love being places uh, 
I'm not against travel. I would love to see better <clears throat> planet friendly fuels and methods for um, safe and effective travel around the world uh, because I love being places. I'm not a fan of airports and airplanes, to be honest, um, in any way, shape or form, but uh, I'm not sure who is, but, but being places and being with people and friends and making new friends um, and understanding challenges that people are facing in different places around the world. You've, you've highlighted some of them, many of them already, you know, whether it's Neom or, or, or Red Sea or others. Um, Oroville, for instance, is an amazing example um, in a very challenging environmental place of, of, of building back using restorative you know, permaculture. But uh, I, I'm definitely a global citizen. I want my, my son to be a global citizen. He's already fluent in three languages at the age of 10. I want him to, to continue that process and be, be, um, be fluent as many languages as possible. But, but it's also to have an open mind and, and be culturally adaptive, especially to indigenous wisdom. So, you know, we're, we're not trying to be the Disney of eco villages and stamp them out across the world in our mind and our vision, <clears throat> but rather to have a framework that works with the culturally sensitive design thinking and permutations and building materials, especially the circularity in those building materials locally. Um, but that brings forth these kinds of neighborhoods and communities that really work for the people there. Um, that's our why. Our why is exactly what book Bucky put it on the back page of that book, which is to, to make this accessible to all of humanity. And, and that's, that's doable. That's actually doable in our lifetime. Um, but we have to get started right now. <laughs> and yeah, it has I'm, to be... I'm across the board, yeah. I'm so surprised that not more have jumped on it and said, you know, we, we would like the same. It, it, it's, uh, uh, and Bucky in, in many respects, you know, that's that's what he, he wanted. And, and at his uh, 60, 1969, to release the operating manual for Spaceship Earth is is actually kind of a, a crazy thing to do. But and then to put your why uh, a, a very beautiful why right on the back of the book is unusual. The the other ways I see you as a global citizen, one that's not negative at all. And and you know some some of those who would go into local futures and think okay. Um, we need to come go back to the roots and go back to the indigenous ways. Um, there can be a, a, a healthy mix of indigenous wisdoms and those things, but simply from regen villages. So you've got these outreach opportunities, Malmo, London, Canada, Chile offices. You've got Denmark, Norway, Oslo uh, offices and, and setups, and you're doing these villages in, in Sweden or planning, hopefully, in, in many different areas, uh, which is, you know, a couple of things. One, it's, it's very global. Uh, I mean, there's more to come in more areas, uh, uh, e even more in developing countries, well, if possible. But then also, it's almost answering the question that I want to ask you, and that is, one, I want you to tell us about the, the outreach opportunities and how that has developed during a lockdown and pandemic. But secondly, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Yeah, well, we are, like, as I mentioned, a very strange multinational uh, startup company. Um, we're you know, kind of beyond startup because we've already kind of transcended through our, our seed round and, and angel round investment. Um, we are definitely an impact for-profit company. Um, and this was something that we decided early on to, to, to focus on primarily because we understand that there is an effective business model in making life better for people on, on the planet. Um, and not to be greed-based or extractive, but to actually focus on 
on where those touch points are with sovereign wealth, with pension funds. They're sitting on literally a Mount Everest or multiple Mount Everest of capital, especially now with, with the um, divestments from fossil fuels and fossil fuel investments and, and this, 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 this pool of capital that's all around the world that's parked offshore that wants to come back, it wants to invest, but it's looking for at least some amount of, of um, you know, impact rate return. Uh, and, but also it has to meet ESG, SDG and green transition commitments. And so what we've done is we basically put together a, um, a business model that is really supportive of this global supply chain of earthen building materials, of these very large and, and bankable kinds of construction firms, of the big companies with their systems and supports, but also to expose and express university research and R&D into new technologies and emerging technologies, again, that are these modules that can be brought in to bear to support, you know, uh, um, you know, the better way of living on, on earth. And, and in other words, that there is a business model for compassionism. There's a business model for, 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 for competing in, you know, who can be the best at um, the environmental stewardship. Uh, and, and I like that kind of competition. That's the kind of competition that's going to be really fruitful for future generations to come. That, um, that in other words, we can invert and twist and rethink the, the kind of um, uh, capitalism models and competition towards pro-social, pro-environmental um, flourishing means and mechanisms. And, and, and so, there's, it's, so it's a new kind of capitalism it's a, it's a eco-centric uh, capitalism. And that's really where I feel that that's been our, that's been, been the fire in our belly because we recognize that when we can really speak the language of big, big business, when we can really speak the language of big finance, when we can really focus on those giant behemoth players and those who are currently you know, moneyed interests who have land that's locked up uh, under zoning, current zoning conditions, that that, that triangulation is, a, is an opportunity for us to, to create a new kind of model that makes the old one obsolete. And that's really where we've been focused on. So it, the, the traditional eco-village movement, you know, God bless them, we wouldn't be here without this previous knowledge. At the same time, it takes between eight to 30 years to build about a hundred homes in this ground up grassroots kind of way. We just don't have the time left anymore on earth to, to muck about, isn't it? We have to be able to create these, these neighborhoods as quickly as possible, these villages and these towns as quickly as possible that are capable of creating abundance for those people uh, and those communities. So that's really what we're, we're focused on. And I do believe, I really, really do believe that what, by taking that approach, that we will be able to connect the dots. And, and this is where, where, we're go, where I'm going with this, that we'll have our Village OS software, primarily will be a, a software you know, organization, company, um, with access to and the ability to facilitate um, funding for those kinds of developments around the world. And then it really, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because then we can more and more and more bring it to design for extreme affordability. So we can take an 80 to 100 million euro, Norwegian, Danish, Swedish, Dutch, UK, US, whatever, Canadian, et cetera, um, neighborhood development for four or 500 homes and build the similar concept, albeit a bit different, of course, but similar in terms of its regenerative resiliency 
in the global south for 10% of that cost. So four or 500 homes for eight or 10 million euro. And then it's a game changer, right? Because then you can really be working directly with government. You're creating these beautiful lily pads of self-reliance um, that are not cut off from government. They're actually supportive of and inclusive to, to those governments. So that's a, that's a really interesting model that I think that we, we know we can su succeed at. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I love that. It's kind of like, a, a go ahead, I dare you, make the world better type of a, of a model. <laughs> and, and it's a good type of a competition. And I don't think that if others in that competition would not, um, that diffusion of innovation, that Gaussian curve would actually bend the curve down so that you can do your job better and you can reach your why and your goals a lot better if they're prospering as well. And tell you the truth, and we've learned this not only from Tesla, but from many, many other models, the world has a lot of problems. We have a lot of global grand challenges and human suffering that um, we don't just need one Tesla. We don't not need just one region village. We need 100,000. And then we will really not just be tickling the surface of the problem. We'll be tackling it, solving it, and getting back within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. And so I like that line of thinking and how can we disrupt and change the system in some respects to, to, to get it into a, a place where, where we truly need to be um, for that. There um, is really something that I kind of wanted to lay on you and, and, and see what you thought ab about it. Um, and it, it's the term um, regenerative or regeneration, uh, which is something that we deal with. And, and I wanted to see how you thought about this. The word regenerative means creating the conditions conducive for life to continuously renew itself, to transcend into new forms, and to flourish amid ever-changing life conditions. Does that pretty much envelop as well what Regen Villages wants to do and, and what your, th your, your thoughts are moving forward as well as the other things that you've discussed? I mean, absolutely. You know, when when going back again to 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 the work of, of Dr. Suzanne Simard and and um, and looking at at the role of these fungal networks uh, in the not only the conveyance of the nutrients and 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 they do take, by the way, a commission. <laughs> It's not like they don't get a little piece of the action oh, yeah. in, in, that, in that transference, um, but that there is a digestive um, um, renewal and, and, and process that you know, anybody who's walked through the forest or, or, or in a country path you know, can see what's going on when a branch falls, when the leaves fall, and after you know, this deciduous you know, seasonal kind of thing, that... Um, that and all those nutrients are being reabsorbed uh, into, into the soil, reabsorbed into the, the very fabric of what those trees and bushes and shrubs and foliage and, and the wider ecosystem is, is feeding off of and enjoying. So the regenerative word from our perspective is in these flows of circularity, right? You know that when you know, we, we, you know, we've spent the first part of our research at, at Stanford you know, in, in, in early 2013, 14, um, I, was, I was looking at the black soldier fly larvae and the aquatic red worm, uh, for instance, which are these two incredible critters, right? That eat their own weight every day in food and animal waste, um, but are then the perfect nutritional input the live nutritional input for both chickens and fowl uh, and small animals, as well as for, for fish and aquaponic systems. So you're not feeding those creatures these food pellets 
that are not good for them or good for us when we when you know when we when we take their protein into into our ourselves but rather that there's this full circularity and then there's this anaerobic digestion that happens and the anaerobic digestion also creates heat and that heat it can be you know in a certain capacity and depends on on how you're doing with these modules creates a kind of district scale heating supply that can then help to heat a greenhouse above it and then of course you can bring the btus in of the small animals chickens the sheep the goat the that there these modules also connect to that greenhouse infrastructure and their body heat is also contributing in this way um, so you get this unbelievable circularity of flow of food and waste into food that feeds these other other animals into waste and and it really is um it's perpetual in in a lot of ways um and so that's that's our feeling about about uh you know regenerative systems that the output of one can be the input of another that there is an opportunity to look at previously siloed systems Okay, if you look at any building or any neighborhood or any city, okay, it's just a series of these silos, power, water, you know, waste. Um, food is always an afterthought because <laughs> that happens someplace else, isn't it, right? Um, and, and housing and transit and all, they're all siloed systems. But we look at it through the Village OS, through the lens of the Village OS, as actually having overlays that they, they do have effects on implications to and, and can support each other. So for instance, that a water pump that's moving water critically from one place to another or helping to digest waste has a need for electricity. And that electricity ought to know where it's being sent and why it's being generated. What, in other words, what are the whys in those silos? And, and where do they fit with each other and how can they learn from each other? That's really exciting stuff. That is way exciting stuff. And I, I appreciate you going into more explanation of that and, and because it's vital for us to know how this works and, and, and how it kind of really distinguishes itself uh, from all the other experiences, how you've learned on that wisdom and, and, and what type of models you're really functioning under. There, um, I, I've got a few more hard questions for you. Uh, really, th this this one is um, is it, kind of tied to the sustainable development goals in some respects. So, especially during this time of the the pandemic, we've and even before, but especially during this time with all the other unrest that we've had. Humanity all over the world is feeling a dis-ease or a discomfort at our civilization frameworks, our governments, our local communities, that those structures, those infrastructures, and those political things that we've relied upon to get us through these hard times, that they're just not working for everyone anymore. They're working for a select few and, and kind of eking along in some respects, but the in general, no matter what the political or the stance is, there's a dis-ease, whether it's good or bad dis-ease at these civilization frameworks. And so there's been a lot of debate whether we're coming towards a collapse or if we're seeing a new civilization framework begin to emerge. But I wanna go even a step further we in in our world's history so if we do a little big history we've had more than 20 civilization frameworks early antiquity mesopotamia incas aztecs mayas on and on greeks romans uh more than 20 um that have all collapsed only two of them did not collapse because of environmental or ecological collapse, uh, only two of them, um, but they all collapse. And so we go on vacation, we go to the Parthenon or we go to the Roman Col Colosseum and we're taking our selfie on, uh, at, in front of the ruins on, on vacation or, or wherever we go. 
uh, go go to um, all these beautiful places as a vacation, but we're actually selfieing the ruins, the past, the civilizations that don't exist anymore. Do you feel that we're on, on the phase of a shift or a collapse? Is there a new civilization framework emerging? And I guess more so is this is what ties to the sustainable development goals. You, you've, you've alluded to it a couple of times. You've alluded to the sustainable development goals. You've alluded to a circularity or circular economy. There are some models that we've heard, donut economics, circular economics, or circular economy. We've heard planetary boundaries. We've heard the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. We've heard the New Green Deal or the Green New Deal, however you, you phrase it. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm missing any, but there's a lot out there. Are they in competition with each other? Is there one that we need to do? Do we need to do them all? And so I want to get your take and your feeling on both of those things and, and um, how that's influenced you in Regener, or if it has an influence in that, that, but you have some thoughts you could share with us on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really great question. And I've, I've visited uh, in my life many of these, fortunate to say that I've, had a chance to to visit many of these these very beautiful historic sites um, uh, that are ruins, and I've had I think a lot of those similar thoughts about the fact that um, you know at any moment collapse is possible, and 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 where does that happen? How does that happen? Um, I I recount my my stories growing up in New York City as a kid, and how if you wanted a particular kind of Indian food, uh, regional Indian food delivered at three thirty in the morning, you could get it uh, as long as you had money and a place to have it delivered. Well, boom, you could have it, right? But I was also at the same time pretty blown away by how anything actually ever worked because of the fact that you you know when you go down to the subway, you can see these there's layers of you know 100 plus years of 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 uh, brittle infrastructure with these very large um, rodents you know gnawing on cables and wires and things um, and and that was a kind of a frequent occurrence like you would get the brown out the blackout you know those kinds of things um, and Hurricane Sandy, of course, really impacted me in 2011 because my family back east was without power for you know five plus weeks. You know, and and you know, you as we all know, past day like two or three, the romance of a power outage goes away. You know, you the candles, you know, the eating from the freezer, and then the cabinets and the cupboards, etc. And then all of a sudden, well, gosh, the fridge is empty, the, the cupboards are empty. Um, you know, candlelight's getting could be a kind of a drag, uh, and so you go out into the world and you realize that the shelves are bare because somehow or another that the distribution matrices have been disrupted. And in any case, nobody can take your credit card or your bank card because it's all running on zeros and ones and electrons. And so, and even if you have cash, you can't get things. So, uh, it, you know, it doesn't take long for collapse to happen actually. It, it's really just a matter of, of, of maybe just even a couple of weeks, right? And I like to say what saved Manhattan from, <laughs> falling into collapse in 2011 was the fact that they got power up and running in the north part of the island of Manhattan Island. And the, the northerners were kind enough to let the southern Manhattaners come up to, to charge their phones and get a latte, which turns out to be the base uh, need to prevent civilization collapse, as it turns out. So long as you can have your coffee and, have, and charge your phone or your device, um, but all kidding aside, um, you know, uh, I wanted to come back to this fact that, that we are in 2020, Regen Villages uh, was appointed to the UN Climate Secretariat Resilience Lab um, as part of the resilience frontiers. Um, and they recognize that we are one of the top, if maybe top one to three um, uh, bright light initiatives in the world because of the fact that we represent all of the 17 SDGs. And I'm gonna share that document with you, by the way, after the call, this draft that I look forward to, to you engaging with us on. Um, 
because it is actually really uh, important to note that we can and we must look at the Venn overlay of systems and support and, um, and creating the inoculations from a fungal perspective into those silos where they contribute to the greater whole and to the greater good. So that is really our, our, our primary focus that we can, we can um, get governments of the world, the policy makers of the world to understand that there is an absolute abject urgency to change the rules right now. And that if you plan to build and create regenerative resilient infrastructure, not only do we have place for you, not only do we have government and other kinds of grants and subsidies and goodies coming your way and new kind of tax incentives, PS, uh, especially for people who buy or rent or live or build new businesses, especially in these new build and retrofit regenerative communities, but that we can, the government can um, support the fast track replication and scale of these kinds of communities across our state boundaries and across border interactions. Then I think we really have a fighting chance uh, to, to live on a very habitable, beautiful planet Earth um, and, 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 and not live in scarcity or fear, which is by the way, one of the tenets of, <laughs> unfortunately, of, of capitalism is to create a feeding frenzy all the time on things. Um, so this is kind of where, where we're, uh, I would say our hope is that we can be part of this rule change, be part of creating the framework for, as a synapse to big finance, and, and that's really our direction is to work very closely with the UN, to work very closely with these big you know, uh, governments you know, across the EU, US, Canada, other places where you know, green transition is especially front and center. And as we create these new economic models that are proving out, by the way, then the, you know, the, the floodgates are gonna be open wide to a new era of, of thinking. Thank you so much. And I, I have to apologize. That was my faux pas that not, I didn't bring up that, that you guys were selected through Resilience Frontiers as uh, really as a pioneer for what you guys are doing. Um, but but you that that's not the only accolade and, and achievement that you guys have received so far. Um, you guys are doing very well and um, no doubt with you at the head that uh, uh, that there's a wonderful team behind you and things are moving nicely and uh, I, I love your model. I have uh, four last questions for you. One that is my burning question, the hardest question probably for you today, and that is the burning question, WTF. And it's not the swear word, although maybe you and, and those you've been surrounded by ha have, have uh, touted it a couple of times, but uh, it's what's the futures? And it's really, you know, about resilience frontiers and that what's the futures for you and regen villages? What's the plan? Where are we going? Yeah, well, thank you uh, for, those, for that question. And, and um, the first thing I just want to say is that we, we, we are definitely um, looking and in, in the process of bringing in a series A round into our, our Dutch holding company, which is to support our Village OS software development to bring that to, to fruition for the benefit of, of people and planet, but also to help us to realize the first pilot communities in several uh, different climate zones around the world. So we're in the process right now of raising 16.5 million euro uh, in, a, in a series A round. Um, 
and and we've got some really great irons in the fire for that right now. We've got some wonderful family offices who who are engaged in due diligence and strategic partners in due diligence. But you know, there's always that lead investor, isn't it? That the first uh, person who who uh, who who jumps into the pool and shows that the water is great, and and so that we're we're looking for that like roughly five and a half million euro lead investor right now, uh, because then we're really confident that we can bring in that syndicate of investors. And, and with that, we'll be able to actually bring ourselves to a sustainable, profitable business model. I only use the word sustainability as it relates to economic spreadsheets. We, we really lost our ability to use the word sustainability from an environmental perspective, I think quite a while ago. Um, instead, we really have to look at regenerative resilience, you know, as the new, the new terms. But we can, you know, with those proceeds, we'll be able to get to a place where we can, can um, reinvest, invest and reinvest based on those assets that are, will be on our books, which are land holdings, as well as our IP in the Village OS and other things that we're doing. And where are we going with this? Well, our goal, like I've said, is to, to get to a sort of terminal value within five year time. Uh, that's a wonderful uh, celebration for our investors, our angel seed investors, primarily these beautiful, wonderful family offices that have been a part of our journey since, since even early 2016, um, that they get you know, a rate of return that enables them to reinvest in additional kinds of sustainable, regenerative, resilient projects and, and kinds of things, but also um, that we can move forward and, and, and be able to transact with through, let's say green bond vehicles um, and other kinds of, of banking instruments that represent this new way forward for investment at a very large scale. So that we can say, for instance, uh, create a green bond, a Regen Villages green bond that's somewhere in the three to five billion range. And that that money sits on account in terms of patient debt finance. It's only uh, starts to accrue, uh, you know, a patient debt cycle, um, two to three percent, hopefully somewhere in that range. But it allows us to then uh, facilitate funding for these development projects all around the world. So that then we can really align ourselves in joint venture with landowners, with developers, with governments especially, and communities to see the fast track realization of these beautiful flourishing communities as quickly as we possibly can. And then when we sit back and we say, gosh, uh, a decade from now or two decades from now, we've, we've created 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 or more regenerative neighborhoods and retrofits around the world. That's a really good start. <laughs> it's a really I, good start. I, I believe it's a fabulous start. And, and I, I know that uh, uh, our listeners and, and uh, those who are already taking notice of Regen Villages. So I, I believe you're on the right track. The, the other thing is, you know, I don't know if you know, a lot of those uh, villages, the uh, eco villages and villages we've talked about, you know, Fintorn and, and Auroville um, have been um, seeded and funded in other ways. The United Nations gave a lot of funding to um, and I don't know if it was UNESCO or what division or part did of the United Nation or internal organization did a lot of funding as kind of an experimental type of project for Auroville. And uh, I don't know if that money's run out, if it's continuing, but it's been a big learning experience. So I, I believe you're in the right way in, in many respects and uh, not only receiving that from Resilience Frontiers and the UNF Triple C. Uh, around the adaptation and, and as, a, as a pioneer, the World Economic Forum as well has uh, innovators and future of living and, and many other things that I think uh, 
you'll be hearing from them as well. And then that uh, international recognition of, of what you're doing really, really be there. I, I think it's already there, but um, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit uh, longer for some to hear the, the village drums um, over time. I think the truth is that, and this is, this is absolutely my philosophy, right? Is that by region villages attracting and bringing in the, um, the industrial behemoth supply chain forces and the big finance forces that we reduce burdens on government coffers in many ways. We reduce burdens on EU regional and structural funds. We reduce burdens on, on the UN and these other kinds of funding sources um, because we're, you know, we're bringing in that public-private partnership and, and university research and other kinds of collaborations for, for, for understanding this, this absolutely beautiful layers, I call it the lasagna of layers um, of, of research that can happen. That we do that and, and then, you know, again, the delta is really reduced for what, what government has to spend to get these communities built and, and realized and supported. And then the governments then can be a bit more generous in a way towards the UBI, universal basic income structures, um, and or hopefully, to be honest, more generous in terms of taxation structures that make living, building these communities, living in these communities, as I mentioned, building new businesses that come from these communities that support local regional economies that's where we, we want to see government coming into seed and to fruit for, for, for these kinds of places. So that's, that's the method to my madness, okay? It's, um, it's making ourselves attractive to big business and big finance in a planet-friendly way. You're on the right track. I love it. I, you've got my money, so... Um, if there, this is these last three questions are for my sure. listeners. So, um, kind of a takeaway for for them. If there was one message, or even I'll give you more messages that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be? Your message? Well, again, I go back to to Bucky. God bless him. Um, he had this this uh, this concept about trim tabs that when you look at an ocean liner, you know, the, the QE2 or, or any of those giant, you know, kinds of cruise ships or whatever that, uh, or container ships, whatever it is, that they have these, these little flaps attached to their rudders called trim tabs. And, you know, when you look at them, you think, gosh, how could that little tiny flap have an effect on this giant ship? Um, airplanes also, the big jumbo jets also have these, these, these trim tabs. And the truth is we are trim tabs. Each individual person on this planet has the ability to just shift one way or shift another or think one way or think another. And that in the aggregate, we change the course of, of, of this giant ocean liner or this giant jumbo jet in the right direction. For, for how we, at a local level, at a neighborhood level, feed our families, hydrate our families, empower our families, live in dignified housing. And when you can answer those questions, when, you, when you're there for your family in that way, then like I said, you can sit back and start to think bigger thoughts about how you can be a trim tab for other things. I love that. I absolutely love that. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real impacts? Well, I get this question a lot because, you know, I'm, I, I am lecturing quite often. I am doing these lectures uh, both uh, from Stanford and also from Singularity University um, and, and other universities that, that invite me, you know, kind of as a visiting scholar to uh, you know, to, to lecture to. And, and it's a big question for, for young people about, about career choices and about 
where to go with, with their education to, to aim themselves towards these career choices. And, and I have to say that, uh, that you know, we're looking at a, a new era in, in, in regards to work, right? That is going to be replaced in many ways, in many places, depending upon who, whose research you look at, for instance, the Oxford study that shows 87% of, you know, um, of the populace, 47% of, of that, you know, uh, roughly um, will no longer have employment because of artificial intelligent machine learning and, um, and, and robotics, right? And it's not just laborers and, and people on assembly lines, but actually uh, white collar uh, you know, architects, engineers, lawyers, uh, doctors, uh, academics, that, that machine learning can and will be capable of doing things faster and, and more accurately than, than we can. Now, um, we have to, with Moore's Law, we have to be able to, uh, from a societal perspective, match and meet those challenges with regenerative resiliency and neighborhood scale, um, you know, bread baskets and food baskets and, and, and hydration, all those things. We have to be able to meet those challenges in such a way that that machine learning, you know, is a benefit to us and not a detriment, right? So it's, it's what I'm trying to explain to, to, these, to these young folks that, I, that I'm lecturing and, and in conversation with is that uh, where are the gaps in machine learning and robotics and AI? Where are those gaps in terms of human creativity in art and in liberal arts and in knowledge in, in that, that um, those, those, those nooks and crannies that a robot can't reach? <laughs> In other words, that, that's a sweet spot. Um, moreover, this is the most important thing. We have to transition from the concept of work and GDP to self-worth and GDH. So instead of gross domestic product and productivity, gross domestic happiness, which is the basis of, by the way, the Bhutan you know, government, right? Is this, this concept of, how can you live the most happiest life? Um, and that's not squishy science, by the way. And that's not, you know, commune, hippie, you know, kumbaya kind of thinking. This is, this is really critical, important kind of, of knowledge towards well being. So if we can wake up in the morning and you jump out of bed, because you're part of a group of people building something or designing something or working on a cultural event or, or, or artistic endeavor or, um, or you're, you're gardening and farming or you're, you're just doing something that's, that's part of community goodwill and, then, and you know that you're being rewarded for that, right? That's self-worth. That's a very different kind of economic model. And we can ledger those things within a village operating system, neighborhood infrastructure, so that it is um, part of your sustenance. It's part of what you're doing to create a path to ownership, right? So we can have social housing and accessibility to dignified living that includes people's sweat equity and their, their self-worth into very real um, um, equity that then can be handed down to generations. That's really all people want to feel like in life is that they've got self-worth and they're building equity. And I, and I think there, I mean, it ties to what you said in your previous answer about the trim, but it also ties to what, there are no passengers on this spaceship Earth. We're all crew members. We can all put our hand on that rudder and adjust the trim in the direction that we want to go. 
And if we, we um, you know, to say, you know, this is esoteric or this is kind of a tree hugger hippie type of idea that, you know, utopian, uh, no, job dissatisfaction has been the highest it's ever been for the last five years, for the last 10 years. And people are more and more over they're they're ro they're ro they're not being replaced by robots, but they're becoming robots because they're so unsatisfied at the work that they do. And if there was a better option, that they would leave immediately. And, and there is a better option, and that is to not see yourself as a passenger just drifting. That you can you can create your future, and then you have passion and self worth, and you do jump out of bed like you say. And I, I I really like the answers for both of those. The last question I have is really, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? Uh, well, I have a lot of brick marks on my forehead, of course. I think as most entrepreneurs do in terms of, of making mistakes and, and failing. And I have, you know, a, as an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, um, a probably a much longer list of, of attempts and failures than I do in, in successes. But the truth is that every failure is, is a success because of the fact that it, it's a opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to grow. And, and it has rough hewed me and shaped me as a person. Um, I can't say that I would go back and, and do things differently because then I wouldn't be where I am right now in this moment. Um, I know that even in the process of, of, of bringing Regen Villages forward from this research initiative that I was self-funded and working on you know, at Stanford and then, and then taking it off as a spinoff company and there's been all kinds of, of, of sort of fits and starts and, and stops and, and, and redirects along the way, dealing with these very same pressures and rules and regulations and headwinds and, and cabals of, of, of these organizations and groups that don't want change. They're happy with the way things are because that's a business model that they know, that's a business model that they don't want disrupted. They want to just continue um, as always. And, and so we've learned a great deal and we're continuing to learn a great deal. I, um, I can say that very early on, I had an experience roughly, I would think, I'm thinking sometime around 1990 um, right before I had started my first um, software company in Silicon Valley, actually north of Silicon Valley. Um, and I was living actually down in an area called Santa Cruz, California, which is also a wonderful university. UC Santa Cruz is an incredible place in terms of permaculture and biodiversity. But I was um, involved in a really interesting group that was, that was a sort of barn. And then the barn there they had these technologists and they had these naturalists and they had these environmentalists and they had all these different voices and people coming in. Most importantly, First Nations people, First Nations, American, uh, Native Americans who were there on a regular basis doing these drum circles. And um, I had an epiphany back then, way back you know, in 1990, that I actually could feel our mother earth was sick and and needed our help and it brought tremendous tears to my eyes that um that this that these things were happening um and and i i i feel like i should have done more from that epiphany at that moment um, but it became part of my DNA instead. <laughs> and, and it influenced me over the years of the th different things that I've been doing uh, to get to this place where we are now. So um, I guess that's a, it's a little bit of regret that I feel like I could have been doing more sooner. Um, 
But That's what I really hear from so many people. I, I wish I would have started sooner, but I also hear what I hear from a lot of my guests is that really it's about the journey as well. You know, the, the, uh, the journey in, in and of itself. So I really, really appreciate you letting us inside of your ideas and sharing regen villages with us. I, I wanted to show you uh, uh, a used copy of the Hippie Gourmet's quick and simple cookbook for healthy eating because I ordered a copy. I found a used copy here, which in Europe, it's hard. In America, I'm sure it's easy to find. Um, but that's really kind of, you started out uh, doing some very interesting things and uh, we didn't touch upon that at all, but you've been You've been in this space and thinking about food and living and, and those for quite some time, um, but we're out of time. And I just want to tell you, James, it's been a sheer pleasure. Thanks for letting us inside of your ideas. And that's all I have, unless there's something you didn't get to say or talk about today. I really appreciate it. And thank you. I had such an enjoyable time speaking with you, Mark. I, I just really I'm so grateful to you and to your wisdom and to this path that now I feel like we are um, inextricably on together, uh, whether you like it or not, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, that, we love are, that we are now collaborators and we will be building these regen villages together. Uh, and, and so I'm really looking forward to what happens after you hit the stop button on record and, and where you and I are going to go forward. Uh, together. So I'm excited. I, I do. Thanks so much. You have a wonderful day. Thanks, James. Thank you.